welcome to the Polestar 1. Now today I thought we'd do an your questions answered because it's a sufficiently sort of intriguing car. I wanted to know what, well, you wanted to know about it. So we put the question out on Instagram and these questions are all from you. Does it change personalities or does it stay the same? Well, you've got the drive mode cylinder down here, as I shall call it. You press this button and then you just scroll up and down the screen. You've got all wheel drive, which sort of does what it says on the tin. Pure, which is electric, rear wheel drive only. Hybrid, which is its default, so pure, sort of everyday use. Then we've got individual, to figure it, and power for sporty driving, as it says. Will it drift? Well, I've only driven this on the road, which is obviously not the place for drifting. However, because this has two motors on the back and they can torque vector, definitely it allows you to get on the power nice and early and it feels very rear wheel drive and it will sort of, well, certainly push towards oversteer in a corner. Those brakes look like the Evora ones. Any commonality? Well, they're not related to the Evora as far as I know, but they are related to the McLaren P1 because they're made by a company called Akabono and they made the brakes, I think, initially for the Formula One team and then to go on the P1. Are the orange wires cool or not? I think they're cool. It was quite fun opening up the boot and seeing them there. It's like a sort of science museum exhibit. If you live on a real place, say a street with parking, good grief, do those exist? Then how inconvenient is it living with it? I wouldn't say it is that inconvenient. I mean, it's wide, so that might be a little bit of a problem if you're parking on the street and you might worry about parking £139,000 worth of car on the street. But in terms of the drivetrain, it's not that inconvenient at all because obviously you've got the internal combustion engine, so you can fill that up wherever you like and the battery, well you can charge that off the internal combustion engine as well, so I've in fact been doing that a bit because I wanted to save it for the film, so you can just click here and it will run it off the internal combustion engine, charge that battery up so you've got all that range if you're going to a city or something like that. So inconvenient? Not really, because you're not reliant on the EV charging network. Obviously it does make more sense if you are using it as an EV predominantly because then you get the extraordinary MPG figures, etc, etc, but you know, it has adaptability. Would I pick this over a Taycan? Oh, that's a tricky one because they are sort of different things. I think it all depends on what the charging network is like where you live um, because if it's decent enough I think I think the Taycan is probably a more premium feeling car and I, I really enjoyed the rear wheel drive one plus that you know the rear wheel drive one is about half the price of this so to that extent I think the Taycan feels like the better car but obviously if you lived somewhere and there was a certain amount of range anxiety then this would be better this is certainly going to be rarer so yeah would this have been better as an all gas or all electric car? That's a, that's a very interesting one. But I think I'd have to say no, because its USP is this whole idea of being an electric first hybrid, which I quite like. So it can do up to I think about 77 miles, they claim, on the battery alone, which is an awful lot more than most hybrids out there. And Equally, I mean, if it was gas only, would it still have the four-cylinder? Well, that's not particularly interesting, and certainly you can charge as much for it. So, no, I, th I think the interest in this car certainly, or a large part of the interest, is from it being this particular type of hybrid. Is the weight a huge problem? Pun intended. Uh, well, 2,350 kilos, it's always going to be a bit of a problem, isn't it? To be fair, the car doesn't actually drive like... A particularly heavy car certainly uh, I think some of that comes down to the dampers which you might discuss at some point but it's very well supported you do feel it on the brakes and at times but it disguises its mass pretty well but yeah weight is always the enemy isn't it really how is tire slash brake wear compared to non EVs well I, I don't know to be honest I haven't lived with an EV for long enough however I have heard of curious problems in terms of the fact that obviously cars that 
don't really use much braking from actual sort of pad on disc. It's all done as you can do with this through just sort of one pedal and it'll just be done through regen and the brakes actually not getting used enough. So that's a, a sort of perhaps unforeseen problem. Is there too much Volvo S90? Well, for those of you who don't know, this is based on a Volvo S90 platform with, I think, about 200 millimeters chopped out of the wheelbase and also sort of shortened at the rear. More obviously, and I don't think that part is, is a problem at all, what is arguably a problem is the sort of the, the Volvo-ness of the interior, which is not bad, but for the amount of money that this car is, which is 139,000 pounds, it just it, it's always going to struggle because you sort of you can't get away from the fact that this has a lot of stuff in it from a much cheaper car and i don't know it depends really doesn't it? it depends how much you sort of um you value volvo but i think it probably is one of this car's major handicaps in terms of getting people to you know, stump up the cash from it there's not enough bespoke in it in terms of the interior that is do i feel like a nordic god driving one well to be honest i feel like a nordic god most of the time anyway i sort of just carry a hammer around with me and all that sort of thing so yeah yeah absolutely nordic god-esque feelings guaranteed in a polestar one how does it compare to other GTs, such as ones from Bentley or Aston Martin or perhaps the sort of BMW M8? Well, this is interesting. I think obviously in terms of price, you're looking certainly at something like a Conti GT. And I think it's, it's tricky. We'll come back to those dampers because we've got these Olin's dampers, which have 22 settings, front and rear ships, I think with nine clicks on the front, 10 clicks on the rear. And it's quite firm. This is something we noticed with the Polestar 2. And to that extent, certainly at lower speeds, it's, it's busier, bumpier than I would expect from something, I suppose, with this heft and the sort of GT credentials you, you might expect. Again, we come back to this sort of Volvo-ness to it. Does it have that premium feel to it? It's difficult because I don't, I don't think, you know, the, the technical underpinnings and the sort of the fact it's got an all carbon fiber body, yes, that lifts it up and makes it very interesting. But yeah, I, I can't see most people really going for this over something like a Bentley or an Aston, even though it is very good. And in terms of the driving, it's interesting and quick too. Is the four-cylinder characterful enough for the price tag? Well, it's from the, it's the T8 and, well, let's put it into, yeah, put it into power so it's definitely on. And you can hear. Somebody else said, it, does it still sound like a diesel? And no, it's probably not characterful enough really for the price. It, again, it's part of this whole car's powertrain. You have to buy into that. It's not there for character. It's there you know, really as a, a sort of range extender, I suppose, given that this prioritizes the electric side of its propulsion. Can you hear the supercharger whine? Here's something, but not really, to be honest, most of the time, though. No. You're more likely to hear your passengers whine from the uh, acceleration, which is brisk. Is it likely to be a future classic? Yes, I think it probably is. In that slight sort of, it's a, it's a curiosity. And I can see in sort of, you know, 10 years time, people going, oh, do you remember that? The Polestar 1, you know, before they went all electric, they did that, that one off and it was a ridiculous amount of money. It had carbon fiber body and it had sort of, you know, it was electric first hybrid. Yeah, it was, it was a cool looking thing, wasn't it? Yeah, it had sort of way too much Volvo. I can just, it's one of those, like I say, it's a curiosity that I think people, will actually sort of you know get more excited about perhaps as the years go by because it's going to be rare isn't it worth considering it over a tesla all things considered well if you struggle with range anxiety in a tesla then yes absolutely um i also think the design of this is is nicer it's probably a probably a cooler thing but yeah that's not really for me to say what are the dimensions using Henry Catchpole as a unit of measurement? 
I am 195 centimeters tall or just under 6 foot 5 in old money, so that makes a Polestar 1 2.35 Henry Catch poles long, 1 Henry Catch pole wide, this is all to two decimal places by the way, and 0.69 Henry Catch poles high. So now you know. Is it just me or is there something of the Aston Martin Vantage circa 1995 about the looks of this? Well, I think sort of around the front it's definitely definitely very Volvo and these wheels, 21 inch wheels, they look massive I think particularly on this car. But down the back here, I do like this sharp crease here, this portion with the quite sort of long boot and the way that slopes down there, yeah I can see a bit of Aston Martin Vantage in that. I'll give you that. It's definitely an imposing thing, isn't it? It's sort of like the panoramic roof and stuff. Yeah, it um, does look good. It looks like a big fast GT, but the boot is tiny. What were they thinking? It should have been a shooting brake. I think it's more of a statement than a question, but um, should it have been a shooting brake? Well, then you wouldn't have really been able to do the P1800 sort of homage in terms of its looks and yeah, I mean, it's, it's sort of, it feels, there is the sense to this that it was done as a halo car, as something to attract attention, and perhaps a shooting brake would have done that. People like shooting brakes, don't they? Uh, so, yes, I can certainly see the problem. The boot is not big because you've got the batteries back there because they're in a sort of T-shape going down here and then back there as well, rather than being the, the skateboard that we're more used to with pure EVs these days. So, yeah, the boot is pretty small. You can still fit quite a bit in there. It's not the smallest I've seen. Why the carbon fibre body? Good question. I mean, I suppose because, well, it's to do with lightness really because this is a heavy car anyway so 2350 kilos so then you put a you know, steel or I suppose aluminium body on top of that it's going to weigh even more and it's a point of differentiation as I say this is meant to attract people's attention and it does allow them to make some of the really sort of crisp lines on the bodywork which um, are quite attractive. How well balanced does it feel? Does it feel very front heavy? No, it does feel well balanced, which I suppose makes sense because obviously you've got the internal combustion engine at the front and then the batteries at the rear. In terms of power distribution, that internal combustion engine is sending more power to the front than the electric motors are sending to the rear, but the response of the electric motors means that it, when you get on the throttle, it sort of feels more rear biased, I'd say, than front biased, in fact. One thing is when you come into corners, then because it's big and heavy, obviously that sometimes because you're slightly struggling to get it stopped and then turned, that's when something can feel front heavy, sort of regardless of whether it actually is or not in terms of the weight distribution. Top speed, 155 miles an hour, although you can do up to, I think, 93 miles an hour on pure electric. Is it as spectacular in person as it is in pictures? Yes, I think it's just as imposing in person as it is in pictures. Does Henry consider himself a pole star? <laughs> See what he did there, catch pole, pole star. Hat tip to you. How does it compare to the pole star 2? Is it similar or a wholly different beast? Well, I think this is the pole star 1's biggest problem, to be honest, because I think the pole star 2 is fundamentally an all round better car really it's just better conceived I, I know this is a halo car and obviously it's got the 600 brake horsepower and all that but the Polestar 2 feels more of its own thing it feels less Volvo that hey Google um, interface here works so well and obviously it's an awful lot cheaper and I think the design is not as cool it's obviously more practical but it also looks less Volvo from the outside compared to this so I think the Polestar 2 is probably, if anything, the Polestar 1's biggest problem. There we are, then that's all the questions this time. If there was something that you wanted to know, well make sure you subscribe to at Carfection Films on Instagram and look out for the next Your Questions Answered. Probably won't be about this though, it'll be about something else. <laughs>